apparently two of the chickens that are in your flock came from South Carolina. And apparently there's some law about transporting chickens over state lines, that there's a thousand dollar fine per chicken and that the inspectors have to come to the property because the chickens were killed by some coyotes about a year ago. And according to the documents, we are supposed to open up the gates and let the authorities view the remains of the dead chicken. Good afternoon, everyone. As we talk about food sovereignty, Jim Gale with me, Food Forest Abundance. You can see right on the shirt there, grow food. Well, that's kind of the name of the game and one of the solutions we're all looking at. But Jim has a story for us today about the state coming in, $1,000 fine, two chickens that were brought over state lines. So in addition to all the other things we're looking at with food inflation and the rating of farms for you know, raw milk now, it seems to be concerted effort across all states. They're being raided in unison as of the last couple of weeks. There's very few farms untouched by this that were serving raw milk or had raw milk uh, co-ops and that sort of cow shares. So everywhere we look, the Rubik's Cube, the vices, the thumb screws are being tightened on our ability to grow foods during this transition period called the reset. So how are we going to work through this? So identifying the trend of the next move of how your food's going to be limited is going to give us a great chance to be able to find a workaround for that. And I think we're seeing the very first instances of it here. So I'm so glad Jim could join because I really think this is the next big trend of stopping your individual food production at the very local level. So Jim, I appreciate you joining me. I'll let you unwind the story the way you want to. And uh, I can add in the documents, you know, that I screen grabbed as we go along here, but I'd like to let them hear it from, you know, no, no pun intended, the horse's mouth, since we're talking about agriculture here, but uh, yeah, man, take it away. And everybody's going to be awesome. so interesting. You are seeing the future of how your food is going to be constricted. So please get what you can out of it and share with others. Well, and I've been such a big fan of your very important show for so long. And your audience already knows that Henry Kissinger 50 years ago said, if you want to control people, control food. Right? So nothing that's happening right now is an accident. This is a strategy that has a purpose. And so when I look at this, you know, in permaculture, we learn to turn the problem into the solution. Well, the problem is poisonous centralized food production, right? The solution is, is toxin-free, right? Natural decentralized food production. So I started um, playing around with this about 17 years ago, and it started out like everybody who's new to a concept. I was studying the problem so intensely. I went down every single rabbit hole, and I got into a place of scarcity, a place of fear, because the system is really messed up, and I did not see a path to solving the problem. And I have four daughters. And so I went into this scarcity mindset of, oh, no, what are we going to do, right? The sky is falling. Well, I then read Bill Mollison's quote, though the problems of our world are increasingly complex, the solutions remain embarrassingly simple. And I started to bawl. I started to sob. And I made it a commitment that day, I don't know, 15, 16 years ago, to be focused on the solution. To be aware of the problem, but then to be focused on the solution. So um, uh, just the other day, I was uh, a buddy called me and he said, Jim, have you heard about this thing with Cam with Cameron, my, my friend Cameron and the chickens? I I'm like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. He goes, well, apparently two of the chickens that are in your flock came from South Carolina. And apparently there's some law about transporting chickens over state lines. 
We don't have to worry about not having food to last. We have my Patriot supply. And right now, you can save $200 on a three-month food kit with Adapt 2030. Adapt and stay prepared. And I, I, I wasn't aware of that insanity. And I started reading through these documents. And it basically says that, um, and, and it, it addresses my friend Cameron, not me. Um, but they're my chickens. So I read that there's a $1,000 fine per chicken and that the inspectors have to come to the property because the chickens were killed by some coyotes about a year ago. And according to the documents, we are supposed to open up the gates and let the authorities view the remains of the dead chickens, right? You've got chickens buried. They're not in caskets, right? They're not in metal boxes. They're in the dirt. Do you think we can even find where we buried a couple of chickens? Well, first of all, we didn't bury them. We threw them back in the field and let nature do what nature does, right? We're not going to spend extra energy burying a dead chicken when we got 51 acres of farmland here. So I did a video, which then you saw not too long ago, about a week ago, and I called out the individuals by name that had signed the document, the legal document, right? And I called them out by name and I invited them under a condition to God's Landing. I said, this is a conditional acceptance. And I'm just learning the language. And I think this is very important language to learn, by the way. I gave them a conditional acceptance of their grievance, conditional upon the public debate that we will have about why they think they have the right to say to me that they can come on my property and view some dead chicken carcasses. Well, I don't expect them to take me up on the offer. They may try to send force and violence my way. And if they do, I will put that all on video and it'll be a very public display of what is natural and good in contrast to what is evil. But what I really want to do is I want to have the public debate because some of these people that sign these documents, they really are that ignorant, but they think that they're justified to do so. And they think that somehow they're doing good. But at the levels of government, most people simply believe that they are doing the right thing. So I will publicly invite them until they either take me up on the offer or they stop this insanity. Um, so that's one story. I've got uh, three stories that are all really relevant. But that's the first one, uh, Dave, if you have any you know, questions. Jim, could I, could I interject in there for a second here? Now, how were they even aware that these chickens had come from another state and that you know because for me that's so bizarro that they could target two chickens coming from a different state and then land on your property and know exactly where the chickens ended up and then additionally like how are they even finding provocation to give and issue these fines for i mean what is the law on the books literally that says chickens coming over a state line and then you know how much would the medical bills vet bills health checks of these things be if there even were such a law because i've yeah, walk me through a couple of those uh, okay. key ideas so, there, key pieces of information. So what we are aware of now is that this is an agenda that has been in the works for a long, long time. There are plays in the playbook that some people are aware of, and there's probably plays that we're not aware of. Uh, evidently, they did create some laws that most people were unaware of about transporting chickens. The guy, I hired a guy to build me chicken tractors. He built me three chicken tractors and different models so I could try them out and, and see if I wanted to represent these products. And I love chicken tractors, by the way. They're fantastic. Is that Everybody similar to like Joel Salatin's chicken coops where they're movable each day that they can move them across? That's exactly right. Yes. And Joel's one of my partners. I just love the whole concept. So I hired him to come down. He came down, he put them together, and he brought as a gift these extra chickens. On the way down, when he crossed the border into Florida, he somehow he had a trailer and they told him to pull over at one of those way stations or something. And they, when they pulled him over, they said, oh, what's going on? What are you doing? And he told them. And then he said, 
uh, well, what are these birds? And they took notes of everything. And the guy, his name is Rick, he actually feels horrible because when they said, where are you going? He said, well, I'm going to Galt's Landing, right? Which is our off-grid community. We're, by the way, we're 100% off-grid. All of our own food, water, and energy is produced here. And he said, uh, well, what about the chickens? Where are they going? They're going to a guy named Cameron, right? Really, they're going to me. Um, so, so they took notes of this and, you know, months later, six, eight, nine months later, somehow those notes made it back to the right people and they started sending threatening letters. Yeah. The amount of energy and resource. And yeah, I know that's just that's insane with all the world's problems we have with all the <laughs> catastrophic infrastructure failures and just a degradation of what you've seen of your previous life happening. And they're targeting two chickens with yeah. full resources, that should be just like the most eye opener right there. Yeah. Oh man, this the strategy goes so deep, and, and so it, it relates to another thing that happened just recently. Um, where so we have built now ten homes. Um, eight of them are finished. One will be finished next week. The other one, my my lifetime family home, will be finished in about probably three months. And we did not ask for permission. And so I'm not going to ask somebody who is demonstrably corrupt and demonstrably ignorant. I'm not going to ask them to per for permission to do what I know is elevated above their standards massively. Uh, six months ago, it was October, I got a call from my partner on the land. And I'm standing right over here behind me and he's over near my houses. And he goes, Jim, there's a guy here with a badge and a clipboard, and he's asking to see building permits. And I've been waiting for this moment by that time for nine months, maybe even a year. And I had a wave of anxiety and fear go through me. It was just like, and I felt the goosebumps come up and I took a deep breath. And I said, I am justified. I am in standing with, I grew up in Minnesota, so I say God. Right. Um, and so I'm walking. <laughs> There's a chicken. <laughs> I just thought I'd show you. Hey, chicken. Hey, did you get permission to cross that road? <laughs> anyway, so anyway, the guy, I walk over to the guy and I turned on my camera and I said to the guy, I said, uh, my name is Jim Gale and I'm recording this conversation just so we don't mix up any words here. Um, he, and he introduced himself. He said, my name is Alexi. I said, well, uh, um, you know, nice to meet you, but how did you get permission to come on our private land? It's posted. Implied consent is not granted. And I'm citing case law, by the way, all over the front of the property to basically say, don't trespass here or you're breaking the law and, and you will be, you know, prosecuted justly. And he stepped back and he said, I'm sorry. The gate was open, so I thought I would come in. I will leave if you want me to. I wasn't expecting that response. I was expecting an authoritative response. So it disarmed me. And I said, oh, well, maybe. But before you do, I would like to show you what we're doing here and share with you how we are here to serve our community. And I walked him to the food forest, which is right behind me here. In fact, I'll show everybody that because I think I think you'll really appreciate it. Yeah, but so um, you knew you knew the law, and a lot of people don't know anything about law itself. So yeah. very few people today even understand the basic uh, rights of what you know private property is, and because people are starting to get very more versed on what you can do, what you can take, what you can see, what you're allowed to come in or confiscate because this is the name of the game it seems like confiscation there so excuse me for That's barging it. in on the combo nobody thank you for framing that you're exactly right and i am no expert in the details but what i do know for certain is what's right and what's wrong and i stand by that as my foundation and i know that anybody who comes to me that thinks they have authority over my life my energy my productivity my creativity, that they're misled, they're deceived by some type of evil. So I, I, I said, before you leave, I'd like to show you what we're talking about. So 
this is a 26 month old food forest and we're standing right over in the middle of it. And I explained to him that we are here to be the stewards of the land, that it is our duty to our posterity and to the land itself to take care of it and to care for it and to produce abundance to the best of our ability. And then it is our intention to share this abundance with the community because the food supply chain is it has already failed, quite frankly. That's why people are so sick and diseased, so malnourished, even though they're eating 10,000 empty calories a day. So I shared with him what we're doing. And 15, 20 minutes later, he had tears in his eyes. And he said, I'll never bother you again. And that's what I would like to invite everybody to do is stand in your truth, in your knowing with faith and courage and say, I am not going to comply out of fear because I know that we are in the right here. And oh, by the way, I did point out all of the developments that he and his entity is the county people. They approve all of these developments around here. And even as a county, they use glyphosate and Roundup, which kills everything that it touches. And he completely agreed he ended up quitting the job a few months later, and now he's living in an off-grid farm. And at the same time, there's a growing movement of people waking out of their insanity because of the suffering, right? Suffering is a catalyst for change. And there's more suffering now than any time in the history of the world for percentage. And so it's time then to show, to lead, to demonstrate abundance, right? When we when we simply take the poisons out and grow food instead of lawns, if that's all we did, then we would have abundance. And abundance is the answer to scarcity. And scarcity is the catalyst for fear. And fear is what creates war and recruitment for war. Yeah, because I've been, you know, uh, as I was traveling around in Italy and Croatia and Hungary over, you know, at, at the new year that era you know a few months back i kept looking at the paintings and all there was was constant war scenes from you know a thousand years prior until today there's never been peace but all i did was see a continuous barrage and just never ending of war and war and more war and I, at the end of it i was just so sick of going to the museums and looking in certain sections because all it was was a thousand years of straight warfare and that's and and you know and then you look at it the silliness we're encountering today where it's just it's just like a pendulum. I'll take that piece of land. No, we're going to fight for it again. No, we're going to get that piece of land. We're going to get it. And then they just kind of obscure history through there. And uh, yeah. I, I just don't get the mind frame of the of the human race, except being overtaken by an invasive hominid species that has been able to, you know, put itself in charge of what we consider as homo sapiens on the planet over the last several thousand years. And I sit and I go, you know, the reason I'm trying to dovetail this into a modern question is, because the use of legalese to move a lot of agendas and narratives yeah. and to reset society or re, re, uh, uh, re quantify society in a different way, what other laws are you seeing or hearing of right now that are going to be limiting for food supply? Because your ear is pretty much to the ground where you are yeah. and, you know, chicken news, you know, local, international. But I, I see that the raw milk thing is the next one. Uh, not allowing animals across state line, that could be anything from sheep, cattle, pig, hog, chicken. So what else are you hearing? Because they're going to try to constrict everybody into the state. And then within that state, then they're going to do confiscation. So I, you can yeah. already see clear as day where this is going inside the United yeah. States. So what else are you hearing oh. or seeing? Well, the uh, article that came out several months ago that said backyard gardening, five times more carbon output into the atmosphere than conventional gardening, right? Their metrics are insane. And the, the whole narrative- That's is impossible. Craziness, but that's one. That's literally impossible. Have you ever been out to a, a 10,000 acre farm and seen the amount of chemicals that they need? The, the fuel, just the fuel itself in the storage for their fuel tanks is insane. And then the size of the equipment and everything required with that and the repair and the maintenance and the satellites and the GPS and just- Ridiculous, babiculous amounts of, of inputs into that on large farms. 
You know, I, I look at some of these articles. They're so insane that I think they actually serve us because people are like, no freaking way. That cannot be the case. Right. You go out, you get some seeds, you plant some tomatoes or cucumbers, you go out in your backyard and you grab them without having to drive to the grocery store and back. And now you've got your own. It's it's layers of insanity. And they're also then trying to tag every single cow and every single chicken. And they're trying to get us to register, which I, I know you've talked about, our, our backyard gardens with the government. Yeah, they're making you register in Scotland right now. If you don't register, if they... So in, in Scotland right now and Wales, uh, there's a... You have to register your chickens. For every chicken you do not register and they find it on your property unregistered, 5,000 British pounds, fine. <laughs> Each chicken. They really want to know where your food is going to be. See, that's the whole ploy is why do they, why is it such an urgent need to know where every single animal is? Every single possible means for you to have your own protein outside the system. Why does that need to be so cataloged so quickly? It's being forced. And that, that should be another, you know, huge red herring out there that something is completely wrong if they need to know where all the food is. Yeah. Buddy, that question is so profoundly important because the answer to that question leads us directly to the solution it, on two levels. One is we simply have to say no. And the best strategic way to do that is by, by becoming productive and then sharing your productivity with your local community and then inspiring and empowering them to also be productive like we had some people here earlier today and they left with five different plants, sweet potatoes and Cuban oregano and Mexican sunflower and sugar cane and I, one other one, uh, cranberry hibiscus. And they live right up the road. Now they want a food forest. So we're putting in food forests all over this area because it is the local decentralized and self-reliant communities that are going to make it through the next few years. And food is the key to it. Right. In some places in Minnesota in January, it's going to be energy. But overall, food is the one that everybody can figure out, whether it's five gallon buckets in your closet with potatoes or or you if let's say you don't have any room in your house, then, you know, somebody that has a lawn. Right. Talk to that person, say, I will come in and I will create a garden in your yard if I can have half of the produce or something. I, there's always ways to do it. Okay, so this is just today's half of what's out on the plants. So we yeah. share with our friends and family. Now, we've gone the route pretty much of uh, cherry tomatoes because they're really high value and hardly anybody's growing them. And then we go on the romas here. So we got these the the yellow pears and different types of the, uh, of the cherry tomatoes. And, you know, you got to look at that and see – the girthiness of how much, and this is just half of what's on the, because it was going to get windy a little bit later and and uh, we were putting some yeah. trellis on the plants. And uh, these are the duck eggs and the peaches that are coming off from this afternoon. That's so you, you look at this and say, all right, the peaches, you're like, well, they're not perfectly, well, we don't use any pesticides or herbicides on them. You know, we spray with insecticidal soap, but I mean, we got a couple different varieties of peaches out there and there's a new one called... Uh, Sweet Joe that was developed by University of Tennessee and an arborist there. So that's what, you know, you get some of these more succulent type stuff. Oops. You get this one and then we have uh, another one that's sort of a yellowish one. So we got these two varieties and you can see clearly that the, the sugar concentration is going to be different in those. Yeah. We got a couple different types of peach trees out there. Yeah. We got chicken eggs and we got duck eggs both. So, you know, we, we get a fair few eggs every day. But awesome. this is what we have, and we can share with our neighbors, which we do, because one guy is a, like a master broccoli grower. Dude is just master broccoli, but we don't have broccoli. But we can always trade these tomatoes and eggs or peaches or anything to go get broccoli and that sort of thing. And uh, some of the kale, not the kale, but the uh, okra that he was growing. He's got a special kind of red okra. So yep. again, any of this stuff that we couldn't grow because we're overproducing, as you can see right now, and we got thousands more peaches on our trees out there. Really, It's the first year they've really set big, so they're not getting to their full potential yet. Plus, I'm still learning on, you know, when to put the phosphorus in, when to hit them with the 
with the nitrogen in the beginning of the year. So my yield will improve as I learn more about these trees. But this is what we got from today. You, you got to put that in perspective. That's today's harvest of, will it continue forever with the tomatoes? No. The protein off the duck eggs and the chickens, absolutely. And the fruit's seasonal, but I try to line it up doing uh, like a continuous fruit dropper. We have early blooming, but the problem yeah. is they've been frozen. And then we got the mid bloom and the late bloom. So we're going to get fruit from the beginning of the season all the way through the end. And our raspberries are the same way. Uh, but we only had like a little cup full and we've eaten those already. So we had yellow raspberries, uh, red raspberries and black raspberries. So we, again, it's continuous fruit production of that. Pears are coming on strong. We got a whole bunch of different uh, from wind saps to uh, Granny Smith's to the the Fuji's. We got those different types of apples. that will be ready in another you know month, month and a half. But if he and I are talking about this and he you see his food forest, I'm just in a studio showing you that this is what we're getting out. And this type of this here as well. Awesome. Was I a farmer? No, I, I learned all this after I realized there was a huge problem. And let me see if I can refocus myself here. But after I realized there was a huge problem, then I started to take, you know, action for my own. Let me, I need to refocus somehow here. There we go. I needed to take action for my own food production. And I realized that after starting the Adapt 2030 channel that we were going to come to this time, A, systems yeah. were going to break down, B, it was going to get super, super expensive, and C, the government was going to control aspects of food. Because if you look back at every one of these cycles, that's the same things that happen every single time. So I don't know yeah. why in history you would think, well, this time is different because we have the computer. It's happened the exact same for the last six times of this iteration every 400 years, and we are back at it again, and we're seeing the same thing. So knowing that, problem, you know, I, I see the problem, and then this is my solution. And Jim's got, you know, with the gardens there and developing gardens and blueprints and how they can create food forests, that is a solution also. So we're both coming at it from the solution side versus yeah. just talking about the problem. Exactly, brother. That is so important. And, you know, I want to invite, I know a lot of um, influencers listen to your show, and I want to invite all of the influencers to do what you're doing, right? Shine a light on the problem, but add the solution at some point during the show, because if we leave people discouraged and fearful and scared that that we're going to all die, right? If we leave that energy then that energy is a destructive energy. That energy is what resides, right? The residue. So when we talk about the problem, which is very important, and then we also say, and by the way, that's the reason that we should be doing what you're doing, what I'm doing, and what millions of people around the world are doing now, more than they were two years ago or three years ago. So we're, we're seeing an incredible trend. Of course, we're not seeing it on the media, but it's still happening. And, you know, like those apples, right? You can count the seeds in an apple, but you cannot count the apples in a single seed. It's infinite nature's or God's ability to create abundance, all right? So that's the next phase of humanity. And I don't know if it'll take two years to get there or seven years, but I believe that we are gonna transition to that. And uh, it's gonna be because of people like us who demonstrate how to actually do it.